Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. Uh, my guest today is a really great guest, uh, Andrew Watson. He's part of the Royal Society. Uh, he's a research professor at University of Exeter, part of the Global Systems Institute. And we're going to talk about uh, evolution on Earth. And does that tell us that there's a likelihood of life on other planets and other systems? So welcome, Andrew. Thanks for coming. Thank you for asking me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, no problem. It's a fascinating subject. Uh, tell me a bit about your background. And then I want to uh, ask you how you got into what you do and uh, then start asking you about the possibility of life on other planets. Okay. Yeah, I did a, a first degree in physics, and then I, I worked with a guy called Jim Lovelock that some of the people may have heard of. He was my PhD supervisor, and so I changed to, to thinking about the evolution of the, of the Earth. And then I worked in the States at the University of Michigan, uh, on the evolution of atmospheres of other planets, Venus in particular, for a bit. And then I came back and I, I spent to the UK and really went into marine science. But also, I've always been interested in the, in the evolution of the planet, of the evolution of life on Earth and the co-evolution of the planet, as it were. And um, so that kind of leads me naturally into thinking about you know, life on other planets as as well. Mm. Um. So what apparent evolutions has our Earth's atmosphere undergone, and how do we know? Well, it, or we, we don't know in detail what the early atmosphere of the Earth was like. We do know, or we, we, we think, that most of the gases and the volatiles, including most of the water on Earth, probably came riding in on comets, on meteorites that came in from the outer solar system, you know, sometime likely after the Earth was mostly formed. And that uh, that atmosphere would have looked pretty much like the atmospheres or in composition, like the atmospheres of Venus or Mars, which is to say it probably was mostly carbon dioxide, uh, had a bit of nitrogen in it, some other noble gases, no oxygen to speak of, maybe some hydrogen and, stuff, and a bit of methane. So a very different atmosphere. Um, quick, how much bombardment, how many comets would be needed in order to have the amount of water we have on Earth today? Well, the reason that we think this, of course, is that the models for the evolution of the solar system at that time 
they don't have water here at, at the location of the earth. The water and the other volatiles condense much further out, you know, around the orbit of Jupiter. You, you don't really need a huge amount because most of the earth is, is not water and volatiles. And there are some big uh, protoplanets out there. There's one called Ceres, for example, which is big enough to be, you know, it's at least it, it's almost a planet, as it were. It's um, it's round rather than potato shape. Uh, you know, two or three of those hitting the Earth would probably have brought all the water that we need. Right, but um, typical comet size, uh, how many of those would be needed? Oh, it, it, well. You know, Ceres is really big, but um, has anyone done that calculation? You know, based on the amount of water on our planet, how many comets would be needed and of what average size? I expect somebody has, has done that. But we and we really don't know how much you know how big the well, were they comets or were they bigger uh, meteorites something coming from the from the the present asteroid bill for example so I don't I don't, I've not seen calculations on that but the calculations but that I think you know people do think that this is a pretty viable mechanism don't know exact numbers okay so yeah please keep going so comets other yeah okay hit the earth. Like so, so that, to it. And then, and then uh, another question about, about the bombardment, uh, would it have been short-lived? Did it need to be short-lived or could it have been over a very long period of time? And, and how would this change the Earth's atmosphere with each successful bombardment of a comet, let's say? Well, we know that there was some water on the Earth, you know, really quite early, by 100 million years after the, the original formation. But we also know that there's there are episodes of bombardment that go on for much uh, much longer than that and well after the formation of the Earth. If you look at the moon, the, the surface of the moon, you know, it looks, it looks like it's been through uh, quite a bashing. And most of the, that bashing was the so-called late heavy bombardment, which is somewhere around 3.9 billion years ago, well, which is a good half a billion years after the planet has formed. So uh, there was a bombardment at that time of the inner solar system, which may well have been where much of uh, these volatiles came from. So it was probably a pretty long process. That that bombardment, incidentally, the, the theory is that that was caused by reorganizations in the out, with the outer planets, Jupiter and Saturn, which at that time came into resonance uh, with one another, and that caused all kinds of chaos in the in the early solar system. That's that's the theory. So we got an atmosphere at that time, and we also know that life started on the planet at pretty much about the same time. I mean, the earliest rock. This is a, a really fascinating and important finding. The earliest rocks that could have evidence for life on them, on you know, because they're sedimentary rocks or at least they're metamorphic now, but they were laid down in sediments, those rocks look as if they have evidence for life in them. So life has got going, you know, as it looks to me like as soon as the Earth was stable enough to be habitable. And that life would have been bacteria, of course. Uh, they definitely, they weren't photosynthetic. But at least they didn't produce oxygen. They probably would have been killed if there was any oxygen on oh, no, They were obligate anaerobe to survive. Well, yeah, what would be the atmosphere? What would be the composition of it at this time, do you believe? Mostly carbon dioxide and, and as I say, some, some methane, some, a little bit of nitrogen probably. There may well have been hydrogen, probably probably quite a lot of hydrogen, but because hydrogen escapes from the planet, from, from Earth, so it's difficult to keep an atmosphere of hydrogen. Anyway, those organisms probably pretty soon started using some of the carbon dioxide. They pretty soon... Uh, started producing methane, probably, because, you know, we know method, methane production is an old uh, trait of bacteria. So they, right from the beginning, they would have been starting to alter that up. Uh, what percentage of methane in the atmosphere or in the environment do today's methane-using uh, bacteria consume? Like, what, what levels are necessary? Well, they, um, in the present atmosphere, you know, there's a couple of parts per billion uh, of methane. And methane, you know, that that's a lot of that is produced by methane bacteria, methane producing bacteria. They live in in wetlands. They live in the in the guts of um, of cows. Uh, they live in the guts of termites. 
and they produce much of the methane of the two parts per million or so of methane as it today. And that methane cycles through the atmosphere very quickly. Although it's only two parts per million, other compounds are at much higher concentration. Actually, it only lasts a, a few years in the atmosphere, so they has to be produced at a fair old rate. How would the Earth transition from a carbon dioxide dominant to a nitrogen dominant atmosphere? What would that look like, and what would be the characteristics mm -hmm. if you could re create such a thing today of a again carbon dioxide dominant atmosphere versus nitrogen? Well, there was probably a lot of carbon dioxide in the early atmosphere because there has to be, you know, we something must have kept the planet warm, and so we think there was a much stronger greenhouse effect back then because the sun. This is another important, you know, factor about the evolution of the planet. The sun was much less bright at that time, probably 25% less bright. And if you take, were to take the modern atmosphere and turn down the sun by 25%, then the planet would freeze over. So the early atmosphere must have had more greenhouse gases. And we think that those were carbon dioxide largely and, me and methane too. And then... So the bacteria probably used some of the carbon dioxide and they made some of the methane. And then the big event is about 3 billion years ago when oxygen photosynthesis was invented. And that's invented by, well, it was invented just once by a single organism. So, you know, it, and this is probably the most important organism in the history of the planet Earth. It's a, it was a single bacteria that did that. And all of the photosynthesis that you see today comes from that one that one event. That's a pretty amazing thing. Yeah, but how could anyone possibly know that? How can we know that it was a single event? Well, it could have been a single event, I'm sure, but one bacteria, I don't, I don't know if it would have cut it. Well, you know, perhaps conditions were such that trillions of bacteria at that time were able to adapt and, and now start using the oxygen in the atmosphere. So still a singular event, you know, very localized in time, but maybe, uh, I don't know, you know, a thousand years or 10,000 or a hundred thousand years is, is still considered maybe a single event in the, the landscape of time. But what, what would well, this look like if you put some um, bumpers on it? What do you think it would look like? What happened? Well, I think that the actual, you say, you know, photosynthesis, oxygen producing photosynthesis is an amazingly complex uh, piece of uh, biochemistry. And... Uh, you know, one organism, it, it has to have evolved initially in one organism. It didn't simultaneously, you know, very shortly after that, maybe that organism is very successful and produces a lot of offspring. But initially, it has to evolve in one organism. So it is a single organism that did this. So then, and we know that that organism is subsequently, you know, if you look at a tree today, the, the photosynthesizing part of it, is uh, is the chloroplasts as they're called inside uh, the cells of the leaves, and those chloroplasts you can still see the the bacterial DNA inside those chloroplasts. So they come from the essentially the ingestion, the symbiosis with what was originally a bacteria, and that's true of all the different kinds of photosynthesis on the planet today. So it's a single organism that did it. I don't see how else it can possibly be. Okay. You know, subsequently, that probably occurs about 3 billion years ago, and subsequently, oxygen doesn't appear immediately by any means. It takes about half a billion years, in fact, for the oxygen to actually appear as free oxygen in the atmosphere. But when it does that, that's, uh, you know, a turning point in the planet's uh, history. And once the oxygen appears, it never disappears. So from that time on, there's some oxygen in the atmosphere, and the whole planet changes at that time. You know, it goes from being dominated by carbon dioxide and pretty, pretty reducing its environment on the surface to being oxidized, and the rock, the type of rocks changes, change, the atmosphere changes, the ocean changes. Where would this large source of oxygen come from? Where was the predominant carbon dioxide coming from, and how would this switchover occur? Well, that's a very interesting question, actually, and it's actually, over the last 10, 15 years, we've got a different picture of that. What we think actually happened is that the oxygen photosynthesizers would have been consumed, they basically, you know, had a new way of making organic, and they would have been uh, eaten by other bacteria 
And so you end with a lot of production of methane. You have methane and oxygen being produced simultaneously. But the oxygen initially it is, is simply used up by all of the, of the reducing rocks lying around. There's a huge amount of reduced iron, for example. The methane, however, can release it into the atmosphere. In, in the upper atmosphere, that forms hydrogen and the hydrogen escapes from the planet. And it's ultimately that hydrogen escape that oxidizes the surface of the planet. So it's actually so the process of, by which Earth has become this very unusual planet, I think, that's oxidized and um, with a, a large amount of oxygen is atmosphere, is actually an hydrogen escape from the top of the earth. Yeah, it's just weird. What do you guess the percentage of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was before the changeover to, uh, you know, to the availability of, of oxygen? You know, today, just ballpark, and I could be totally wrong, oxygen's yeah. about 19%. That's right. Carbon dioxide, you know, 450, 500 parts per million, you yeah. could just throw some average out there. Um, but what was it before this changeover? How much carbon dioxide do you think there was percentage-wise and methane and other stuff? Well, probably there was about one, at the time of that changeover or just before, probably about one bar of oxygen, one atmosphere of oxygen. So that, uh, sorry, one atmosphere of carbon dioxide. So, you know, as you say, carbon dioxide these days is like 400 parts per million, so which is like... 0.04 percent and back then it would then have been what's that it's about about 50,000 times as much so uh, that's why it was a strong good you know, yeah, you know with that much carbon dioxide you get pretty warm just ballpark is that is that two percent or twenty percent i'm just you know, my uh, math is off a bar of ox, a bar of co2 would probably be, have been about 80 percent 70 80 percent of, of the total oh wow okay um, Similar to how uh, nitrogen is today, seventy. Yeah, there would have been similar amounts of nitrogen as today. That's that's our thinking at the moment. If, if you look interestingly, if you look on Venus, the actual amount of nitrogen in the Venus atmosphere is about the same as the nitrogen on Earth, and that is, you know, maybe because most of the nitrogen on both of our planets, both of these planets, is in is in the atmosphere. Of course. You know what I think might be a really important calculation is, um, you know, how much is all the nitrogen that Earth holds right now in the atmosphere? You know, how much is all the oxygen, all the carbon dioxide? And then you go to your historical model and you put in those amounts too. So, yeah, you know, where would uh, I don't know, trillions of, of tons of carbon dioxide go? Where would you know, billions or trillions of, of tons of oxygen come from, nitrogen come from? Yeah. You have this incredibly huge cycling of yes, indeed. gases. Where do they come from and where do they go? Right. And now and I would home right. to figure that. You know. And and I and, and we have at least, you know, I wouldn't say we know it all for sure, but I would say most of the nitrogen that's in the atmosphere now was most of the nitrogen on the planet, uh, in fact, is in the atmosphere, most of the of the accessible nitrogen in any way. And and it was probably the same then. The carbon dioxide has largely gone into the oceans and then into the and then into the rocks, into carbonate rock, uh, especially. The oxygen has mostly come from the water and the hydrogen that was, you know, water is H two O. The hydrogen has escaped to the uh, gone off the planet. So we still have the same, you know, mostly except for that hydrogen. The volatiles are all still here, but they're in different places. But yeah, just numerically, I just wonder. Um... How well it adds up. That's what I was. We've done that kind of modeling. It adds up uh, pretty well. Yeah, pretty well. Yeah. Well, so, what would be necessary to happen nowadays for a massive changeover in the uh, atmospheric composition we have right now? Like, what what would do that? What could well, do that? let's suppose that all life on Earth were to 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 cease, and all, all photosynthetic life were to cease. You'd get a, a big increase in the carbon dioxide fairly quickly it would come out of the oceans it would then come out of the uh it would start to come out of volcanoes and it wouldn't be taken up by it and the oxygen would decline it would take uh several million years to go completely but it would that the oxygen would, would go and you'd end up with a planet that that had but you know still the nitrogen well actually slowly the nitrogen would go too because it would um it would end up dissolving in the oceans as nitrate 
So mm. it, you'd end up with a carbon dioxide atmosphere, but probably a thinner atmosphere than we today. So what do these dynamics tell you about, you know, a healthy and stable planet? You know, when people talk about global warming and all this other stuff, um, you know, you mentioned that life is essential for, for this, uh, this respiration to happen, for this oxygenation to happen, you know, photosynthesis. So um, we need quite a substantial amount of it, again, in order to maintain. So w what does that tell you about all the, uh, the people talking about climate and everything with the knowledge you know? How much will the atmosphere be affected, could be affected, et cetera. And, you know, does this give you any insight into what could be done to modulate it? Well, firstly, it's absolutely clear that the atmosphere and the oceans today are basically maintained by the life on the planet. So as I've just described, if you take the life off it, you end up with a with a planet that looks, you know, a bit like Mars or a bit like Venus. So so what we have today it's actually essential to have the, the the life on the planet. Now, if we increase the amount, you know, we're in, we're busily increasing the amount of carbon dioxide, and we are going to have pretty substantial effects on the planet. But if you compare the effect, you know, for instance, we are probably going to melt all the ice. We've probably, we've certainly already gone so far that we are going to melt all of the ice on Greenland, and maybe... Uh, much of the ice on Antarctica too. But those are pretty small changes compared to the ones I've just been talking about, you know. So the planet is going to, would end up being warmer and wetter and uh, quite a lot different to what it is today. It would still be able to support life, but it, you know, the main problem is actually the rate at which we're changing it. These changes that I've talked about took place over millions and tens and hundreds of millions of years we're changing the planet at an unprecedented rate and that that's a problem for the life on it hmm. okay so as to the possibility of life on other planets uh, what is your study of our early environment and your modeling of other planets tell you well you, you know so we get there i've done some work on this called steps model and um the the interesting thing about that is from the which links to the, the conversation that we've been having, is that those major changes in the Earth's environment, particularly that change where we got a, an oxidizing atmosphere, which incidentally is followed by an, a catastrophic climate, you know, ice age that lasts tens uh, of millions of years, those major changes in the Earth are seem to be a company or somehow um, maybe promote uh, major changes in life on, on the planet. So at that time, you know, you see the origin of complex cells occurring at about the same time, maybe a little bit after that. And then m more recently, but still a long time about ago, about 600 million years ago, we you have uh, another set of, very, of, another really serious set of ice ages, and that proceeds by some tens of million years, the origins of the complex animals, you know, the so-called Cambrian explosion, which gives rise to the, if you like, the modern world with animals and plants. So evolution of life is really tightly coupled to the evolution of the planet. Quite hard to separate them. It's really the Earth system that's evolving. And in a certain sense, you know, the life of the planet and the planet itself form out close coupled system okay um so do you evaluate other planets that appear to be habitable and then try to figure out their atmospheres what are the main ingredients in the soup of making an atmosphere you know in this recipe for uh for planets and, and what are you evaluating when you look out there well you have to distinguish between the planets of the solar system which we know quite a lot about we know a lot about their atmospheres and the planets around other stars the extrasolar planets, as they're called. Now, the there's no other planet in the solar system that looks to have, um, you know, clearly there's no other planet or in the solar system that has, you know, the amount of life occurring at its surface that the Earth has. We do think that there's the possibility for bacterial life, you know, down inside some of the moons of Jupiter, for example, or Europa, Ganymede are uh, possibilities there, 
But that's, we're talking about bacterial life there. And it's not the kind of vibrant life that affects the whole planet in the way that the Earth does. Then there's a question of looking for, you know, Earth-like planets around other photos, around other stars. And the problem there is you can't see the planet. You get to know about it really by the effect that it has on the star line of, of the star. And so far, we know extraordinarily little about their atmospheres, but you can tell whether they're in the so-called habitable zone, which is to say the whether they're the right distance from the planet to have liquid water on the surface, which at least is, you know, that's a, that's a prerequisite for the kind of life that we have on Earth. Um, on planets that would have bacteria, you know, possibly what, again, what kind of atmosphere could support uh, bacteria? Multiple different ones uh, for more advanced life, only one set of conditions. Like, what have you evaluated and how does this lead into the probability that there's some kind of life on other planets and in or out of our solar system? And what's the probability that there's advanced life? So, mm -hmm. you know, how do you go about evaluating this, figuring out what's possible where? And what's needed where? Well, the kind of thing that we are looking for, if we're looking for life on an extrasolar planet, would probably, I mean, what people really want to see is, is there oxygen in, in the atmosphere? And although oxygen itself, you know, there are ways, we know ways in which it ought to be possible with, uh, over time, to get, some kind of information on the atmospheres of planets around other stars. You know, for example, when the planet moves between us and the star, there's a period where, you know, some of the light from the star goes through the planet, so you can do spectroscopic analysis on that and make, and get some information about what's in the, the atmosphere. And although it's difficult to do that with oxygen, you can do it for ozone, and ozone... If there's going to be ozone in the planet, in the in the atmosphere, almost certainly there's going to be oxygen too. Mm. So, so that's something that people would very much like to be able to do. And at the moment, we can't do it. And even the you know the telescope that everybody's uh, really excited about at the moment is the James Webb Telescope, which mm. is a, a infrared. It's looking in the right area of the radio spectrum to see of the light spectrum to see those kinds of signals but the difficulty is it's just immense in trying to in trying to get those signals but these signals will occur basically only when the planet moves in front of the star and only for a short time when it does that and it's going to be tough to do that and whether the, the james webb will be able to do that or not i think is uh is a moot point at the moment so but we do, you know, there's certainly plans to put to to try to get telescopes that would be able to do that kind of thing. And we'd be looking for ozone, which might be diagnostic for oxygen, but also for a whole slew of other gases that might be produced by bacteria. Things like uh, sulfur gases, you know, and methane, mostly reducing gases, gases that are in very low concentrations in the in our atmosphere because of all the oxygen. But yeah, we have ideas about what, essentially what the early Earth atmosphere would look like, and we would be looking for those kinds of gases. Mm, okay. Well, very good. Um, what's the best place for people to find out more and see the latest and greatest in terms of models? You know, where can they go? Well, good question. There, there's quite a lot written about on that's on the web. If you look up the James Webb Telescope and look up, if you ask the question, what was what's the web built for as it were this is one of its you know prime missions is to look for to be able to examine the atmospheres of extrasolar planets so there's quite a lot written on that uh, 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 about quite a lot less i would say you know you start out i mean we wrote i wrote a book with my colleague tim linton about 10 years ago called revolutions that made the earth which was kind of a semi-popular book which was took us through the evolution of, of this planet and Tiru has written a book a, a much shorter book called a short guide to earth system science and that is a, is a good book to look at to look at some of this stuff as well it's not it's not a lot i i think 
I'm astonished at how little there is, in fact, written about the early history of of the Earth, because we now know quite a lot about it. So I wish I could give you, could say, go to this site or this website, but actually I don't know it one. Yeah, no worries. Well, Andy, it's been a good call, and I appreciate being on the podcast, and hopefully you're going to be the one that fills in this whole huge knowledge bank of information for your studies. So thank you for being here. Okay, well, thanks for a good talk. Yeah. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.